Hello, my name is Ilka Grunewald and I'm here today as a guest on the campus of RWTH Aachen. Earlier this year, the university published a literature study on the impact of humidity on humans and their health. And that's exactly what I'm going to discuss now with Kai Rewitz, team leader at the Institute for Energy Efficient Buildings and Indoor Climate. Mr. Rewitz, to what extent does air humidity influence humans? Humidity affects various aspects of the human body, including comfort sensation, that is, how comfortable or uncomfortable we perceive our environment to be. However, there are also direct and indirect influences on human health. Indirect influences can be, for example, influences on pathogens, such as viruses with regard to infectiousness. And there are also direct influences on human health which can be observed in sleep quality, and in the skin, eyes or respiratory tract. How does air humidity affect the eyes? Our eyes protect themselves with a tear film, and this dries out under very dry environmental conditions. If we spend a lot of time in a dry environment, it can be harmful to the eyes. This means the quality of the tear film is reduced and our blink frequency increases. This may lead to irritation in the eye, which feels uncomfortable. There was a study on this back in 2006 conducted by Sunwu, where this was investigated experimentally. In the study, a group of probands was firstly placed in an anteroom, which was conditioned at an average humidity of 50%. Following this conditioning, these probands then entered a room which was conditioned at either 10, 30 or 50%. It was found that their blink frequency remained constant at 50% and there was a significant increase in blink frequency in very dry environments, that is, at 10 and 30% air humidity. Nowadays, we sit in front of screens for hours at work. This also strains the eyes. Could humidity be helpful there too? Yes, of course. The statement that dry air is not so good for the eyes is generally valid. Particularly if we really look at the screen for hours, then of course it is also helpful. In these situations, maintaining adequate air humidity is especially important in summer when we're using air conditioning, or in winter when the air is also very dry. What is the situation with the respiratory tract? Does humidity have an effect there too? We breathe in a large number of particles from the ambient air day in, day out, with the larger particles usually being absorbed in the nose and then eliminated via the nasal secretions. Smaller particles can penetrate into the bronchial tubes. This is not bad at all because the bronchial tubes also have an endogenous cleaning function via the mucous membranes. However, if we find ourselves in dry environmental conditions, this cleaning function can be impaired. This cleansing function is carried out by small cilia that pulsate about 450 to 900 times per minute and continuously transport this mucus, which contains particles or even pathogens, towards the pharynx. This mucus is then expelled or swallowed, rendering it harmless. However, if we spend long periods of time in dry environmental conditions, this mucus layer becomes very tough, which makes it very difficult for these cilia to transport the mucus onwards. The transportation is slowed down. This gives pathogens much more time to penetrate this mucus layer. At the same time, the mucus layer also becomes porous. This makes it much easier for the pathogens to get through. As a result, we humans become much more vulnerable to infections in dry environmental conditions. How does air humidity influence the particulate and viral load in the air? On breathing, talking, coughing or sneezing, we expel a large number of droplets. These droplets mostly consist of water, but they also contain dissolved components such as proteins or salts. And in the case of an infection, they also contain viruses. The larger droplets fall to the ground rapidly within a few meters, the smaller droplets, also called aerosols, however, are so light that they ideally follow the air current and thus remain in the air for a very long time and may also be inhaled by other people. So, air humidity influences both the infectiousness of the viruses and the dwell time and suspension time of these aerosols in the air. 
In a very dry environment, the water portion evaporates from the droplets. These droplets then become lighter and also linger in the air for a longer period of time. And if the air humidity increases? If the air humidity increases, this evaporation process does not take place as quickly, which means the droplets are still heavy and they fall to the ground after a shorter time. This means that the dwell time of the potentially virus-laden aerosols will then be shorter too. You just said that humidity also impacts the effectiveness of viruses. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, I'd already said that these droplets also contain dissolved proteins and salts, as well as the water. And in very dry environmental conditions, this water eventually evaporates completely. The salt then crystallizes and forms a kind of protective layer around these viruses. They are then preserved. That is, the droplet's infectiousness is preserved. At medium humidity levels, there is no crystallization. Instead, these salts become concentrated in the solution. And that has a very deactivating effect, that is, it kills off the viruses. So preferably, lots and lots of humidity, right? Well, not quite. At very high air humidity levels, the salts in these droplets would become concentrated at a much slower pace, which would also lead to a weaker deactivation of the viruses. This was actually illustrated quite nicely in a study by Hosseini. It showed the suspension time and the lifespan of viruses as a function of the indoor climate. And a very dry and cold climate is actually the worst for humans in this instance, because this is where both the suspension time and the lifespan of the viruses are longest. What happens in a dry and warm climate is that the viruses are deactivated a little more. This is due to the higher temperatures. But even here, the suspension time is still quite long. A moderately warm and humid climate is actually best for humans, because this is where both the suspension time and the lifespan of the viruses are shortest. So, the risk of catching flu, for example, in warm, well-humidified air is low. Well, the absolute risk of infection naturally depends on the number of people who are infectious and, of course, on the pathogen also. For the influenza virus, however, it's true to say that the probability of becoming infected tends to be higher in dry environmental conditions than in medium and high humidity conditions. And there is also a study on this by Noti from 2013. Here, an artificial head was set up in an experimentation room to serve as an emitter. That is, this artificial head had an artificial breathing and coughing process which ejected the aerosols loaded with the influenza virus. Two meters away, a second artificial head set up to operate as a recipient inhaled these aerosols. The infectiousness of these aerosols, or the viruses they contained, was then measured. And what was then proven was that across the entire humidity range, which was measured over seven measuring points, that is, for a humidity level of 7 to 23 percent, these viruses showed an infectiousness about five times as high as that at a humidity level above 43 percent. The scientific literature and standards and guidelines provide very different recommendations for the upper and lower limits of relative humidity in indoor spaces. What conclusion was reached in the literature study by RWTH Aachen? What humidity range can be recommended for an indoor space? The influence of humidity, of course, has to be weighed up separately for each criterion and each application. In general, however, it can be said that very low humidity levels may negatively impact the human immune system and the body's ability to heal itself. At the same time, this relatively low air humidity also constitutes a favorable environment for pathogens such as viruses and bacteria. Average air humidity in the range of 40 to 60 percent does not seem to impact human health negatively. Moreover, it has a harmful impact on pathogens such as viruses and bacteria. However, very high air humidity levels, such as above 70 and 80 percent, lead to an increase in house dust mites and mold growth in indoor spaces. 
So these high humidity levels should also be avoided, so as to avoid sustaining the human health hazard they carry. So the optimum humidity range would be 40 to 60 percent relative humidity? There is a very nice diagram by Sterling from 1985 that depicts this fact quite well. It shows how bacteria and viruses prefer very humid and very dry environments. The growth of dust mites and molds is particularly favoured in very humid environments, and respiratory diseases occur mainly in very dry environments. We actually see the least adverse effects for humans in medium humidity conditions in the range of about 40 to 60 percent. This is simply because the influence of pathogens is also lowest in this range. Our study largely confirms this finding. We see here that experimental studies since 1985 have also come to the same conclusions. This means that the respective studies point to an optimum level in the range of 40 and 50 percent, and in some cases even higher. Of course, we also have to take into account that humidity ranges of 70 and 80 percent and upwards favor the growth of mold and house dust mites in indoor spaces. That means these humidity ranges should be avoided. Thus, based on the scientific knowledge available today and the studies we've evaluated, we can conclude that a humidity range of between 40 and 60 percent is quite reasonable. Well then, thank you very much, Mr. Rewitz, for your well-founded explanations of air humidity and its effect on human health. We wish you continued success in your research work at RWTH Aachen University. And, dear viewers, if you would like to learn more about these topics, you can check out the website of Condair.